Yes, go ahead, Tony. Jimenez. Present. Diep or Davis. Here. Licardo. Jones. Present. Yeah. Present. We can go ahead and get started. Uh, is there there are no orders of the day today, right? Nothing. Uh, hear ye, hear ye. The uh, today's meeting of the Smart Smart, Smart Cities Committee is hereby called to order. Um, I believe there's nothing on the consent calendar and nothing on the work plan, so we'll just go straight to the first item, Kip or, or Rob. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, members of the public, Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. You'll be hearing a lot more in uh, this committee and in future committees from Rob Lloyd, our CIO, who will be uh, taking over, uh, in addition to myself, on uh, staffing this committee while Bill and Beckel remains uh, kind of a wholly owned subsidiary of food distribution for, for the foreseeable future. So today we're going we're gonna to dive into two uh, topics, uh, data. Uh, a little bit behind the scenes work on that, and then autonomous vehicles, a little bit of the front end of, of the work that we've been doing there. Both of these are a bit of a way back machine in that we'll be reporting out on things that happened pre-COVID. But as we talked about last time, um, much almost all of the work of technology is devoted in these days to supporting uh, the COVID response, either uh, on the front line or behind the scenes. And so you'll hear some of that in data. We'll look at uh, both food and Beautify SJ, which you've heard about uh, quite a lot over the last few days. We'll go back into some of the back end stuff and take you uh, on a deeper dive into data. And then on autonomous vehicles, we will be reporting out on a lot of the work that has taken place prior to COVID uh, and give you a sense of, of where we are and where we aren't in this new era. So I'll turn it over to Rob and, and some great teams who will take you through the rest of the day. Uh, thank you, Kip. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Diep, Mayor Ricardo, <laughs> committee members and members of the public, Rob Lloyd, Chief Information Officer for the city. Uh, we're glad to be here before you. And as Kip referred to, these are two items on the agenda that were updates promised pre-COVID-19. Um, so the citywide data strategy update covers the efforts and results related to data-driven data decision-making in the city. And autonomous vehicles um, will cover the current status of our initiatives and partnerships, <clears throat> as well as where things are um, going because of the impacts of the pandemic. So first up, we have for you Andrew Eric, Olympia Williams, Amory Brandt, and Matt Lesh. Uh, and they're going to take us into a dive on data strategy. And just to start, the city's quest with data is to actually help our community and answer its challenges. So from the pandemic response uh, to food necessities, to beautify SJ, uh, to equity and public safety, the work matters because it helps us make better decisions and create positive impacts uh, for our residents and businesses. And so what the committee will see is a high level strategy for accelerating the city's use of data, as well as examples of what that looks like in practice and as uh, Kip referred to how we've been using it in the disaster work that we have. Um, but foremost among the principles is taking an approach to projects that is data driven by design and resourcing them from the start with people who understand data and can drive a data approach at the outset, which pays dividends all the way through the project. Uh, and last, the work um, that Andrew will cover um, and crew has made clear the need to reinitiate the city's work on our privacy policy. So staff, just for reference, is adding this to the work plan for near-term progress and coordination with our digital privacy advisory task force to then bring back to the committee. And with that, Andrew. Thanks, Kip, and thanks, Rob. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Honorable Mayor, members of the committee and public. My name is Andrew Eric, Assistant to the City Manager and City Data Analytics Lead. I'm pleased to be joined today by Olympia Williams and Amory Brandt, as well as Matt Lesh, to provide an update on our investments, our progress, and our efforts towards becoming a more data-driven city. And as Kip and Rob said, we are highlighting uh, those efforts that have been part of the COVID-19 response. Just on Tuesday, you heard presentations in City Council about both food distribution and Beautify San Jose. Today, we're gonna take a bit of a look under the hood uh, into the data work behind these two efforts and place it in the context of our larger journey towards being a data-driven city. When this committee last heard explicitly about data, we discussed that data was at the heart of San Jose's smart city vision and that the amount of data we would need to tackle moving forward was growing and it was growing exponentially. 
And I know for those of us here today who uh, hold a soft spot in their hearts for data, its value is, is sort of self-evident, but uh, I think it's always important to remind ourselves the real reason why data is so critical, and that's because it allows us to deliver services and serve our community more effectively, more efficiently, and importantly, more equitably by ensuring that we're focusing resources not only on voices that are speaking loudest, but on where we can deliver the most value to our community and to our at most at-risk communities. Because the amount of data is growing, building these data capabilities requires investment, not only in the technology to store, protect, and analyze that data, but in training and recruiting a data savvy workforce and developing data centric processes within the city. And the good news is that we have been investing. Uh, this committee has heard before about the great work of our GIS Center of Excellence. They have uh, once again proved their enormous worth responding to COVID-19 and most recently the wildfires. Uh, and we're also pleased to report that the technical components of our open data community architecture are now live, thanks to the great work of Rob and his team and, and many folks in, uh, in IT who have moved that project forward uh, even during the pandemic. And uh, I think it's worth pointing out that these two investments are not separate, they're very much related. The geospatial data and non-geospatial data are, are two components of a larger pie and together they produce outcomes that are greater than the sum of their parts, which is something you'll see later on in this presentation. This, these investments that we've been making have yielded tangible results for our community. This committee is familiar with, with the victory list of smart city projects and we've circled here ones that have had a particular focus on data uh, and they have yielded results like speeding the time that fire trucks can get to emergency sites, enabling us to understand and close the digital divide, and reducing our city greenhouse gas emissions, just to name a few. Uh, but I think the, the thing to remember for all of us is that these are, these are tangible impacts uh, that our community is seeing. And uh, because of all of this really great work, uh, the city of San Jose has been nationally recognized. In June, we were officially certified as a leader in data-driven local government and as the Bloomberg What Works Cities certified city. Uh, I just want to note that more than 200 cities have been evaluated for this certification in being a data-driven local government, and only 24 have ever received it. So that San Jose is among that group is really a testament to the many years of hard work and investment by so many around the city, and we should be very, very proud. The good part about this certification, besides being recognized, and it's always great to be recognized, uh, is that it enables us the opportunity to, to learn as well. Uh, and it reminds us that uh, this isn't the end of our journey, but just the beginning. Uh, and as part of this certification process, uh, we've learned about uh, where we stand and how we can advance further. What you're seeing right now is our certification scorecard from, from the Bloomberg What Works Cities program. Uh, there are eight categories that are evaluated as part of the certification process. Uh, but before talking about those, I'd just like to note first and foremost that, uh, that this is not an easy test. Uh, you can see uh, that the bars represent uh, the scores that, uh, that we received. It, that's the yellow bar and the other two bars compare us to other cities around the country. And uh, you know, cities are not scoring in the, in the 90 and 100% categories. Uh, you know, in, in this era of, of great inflation, uh, Bloomberg avoids that, and, and this really is a very, a very rigorous standard that, that we're held to, uh, and I think that's, that's good because it allows us to learn. Um, and, uh, you know, there are places in this scorecard where the, the city is really excelling. Uh, in general management, which measures the strength of our leadership in modeling and pushing data-driven work. In open data, which we've been investing in since the city passed its open data policy in 2016 in performance analytics, which measures our use of data in delivering community services. And lastly, in stakeholder engagement, which measures the extent to which we are engaging the public using uh, open data and other data sources. And on, on that measure at the bottom, we scored 100%, which is something to be proud of. Uh, at the same time, there are also places where we can improve. Uh, and in our case, that's in the area of data governance, which is a, a little bit of a technical term, but uh, simply put, data governance is about making data in the city easy to find, easy to trust, and easy to share. My favorite way of, of describing this is by describing uh, its, its opposite, uh, using an anecdote I, I heard from someone within the city 
who said uh, that sometimes uh, looking for data within San Jose uh, feels a little bit like the data is locked in the closet and only the crazy uncle has the key and, and knows where to find it. And putting in place good data governance is about going into that closet, fighting through the cobwebs a little bit, uh, and making that data a little bit easier to find. Who's the crazy uncle? I think it depends on the situation, which is the problem. <laughs> I think it may be me. <laughs> Um, good, good data governance is about uh, putting data in a library that's easy to find. And uh, as we noted at the beginning, thanks to Rob and his team, we now have a library uh, in the form of our open data community architecture. And uh, now we need to fill it and, and organize it really well. And this brings us to a discussion of the city's developing data strategy, where data governance plays a, a key role. As Kip and Rob have noted, uh, this strategy is a work in progress uh, and it was put on pause during the COVID response. But we want to quickly preview some of the ideas that are contained within it uh, as context for uh, some of the presentations and demonstrations that you'll see later. The data strategy that we've, working on, that we've been working on contains three pillars. First, democratizing the value of data across the city. Second, fostering communities of data-driven practice. And third, enabling data-driven teams and organizations. The first one, democratizing the value of data, is really all about good data governance and really describes why it's so important. Uh, because when we have good data governance, we make it possible for more people across the city to use more data with less effort. Uh, some of you may remember a prior presentation from a community impact fellow with the city who used data to, uh, to uh, predict things related to the mayor's gang prevention task force. And in that presentation, I believe his name was Alfred, he noted that uh, he spent the first six months of his time at the city hunting for and organizing data, and then one month actually doing the analysis. Uh, good data governance means flipping that ratio and uh, democratizing data so that it's easier to use across the city. Of course, at the same time, we're striving to organize and share data and use it for innovative purposes. We also need to be cognizant of how to protect it and how to protect our community. Uh, and as Rob noted at the beginning, uh, data, privacy, and security all go together. Uh, and so our data st strategy uh, must be incorporated and merged with uh, both our security policies, our information security policy, as well as the city's digital privacy principles, uh, as well as hopefully soon a digital privacy policy. Okay, now for the fun part. Uh, you've heard a lot about these two efforts uh, in the past, food distribution and Beautify San Jose. And today we're gonna take you under the hood of how we've used the strategies of our evolving data strategy for both of these efforts. We'll start with food. Uh, and during the emergency response, I've been part of the data unit within the food and necessities branch, which was charged with ensuring the entire branch could use uh, data in its approach to its work. Uh, the committee will have seen at Council on Tuesday a graph like this, which shows across all seven distribution channels uh, the amount of food we've uh, coordinated and distributed as part of our response, uh, as well as how that compares to the pre-COVID baseline, which is the bottom line here. You also may have seen uh, this online map, uh, which was uh, constructed and maintained by our GES Center of Excellence. This map is available to the public uh, and uh, enables people to find different types of food distribution sites where they can obtain food assistance during the pandemic. Under the hood of both of these efforts, obviously, and many more, is data. And when we talk about data uh, in, in the context of any project, but particularly in food, we're often talking about different types of data used for several different types of use cases. In the case of food, uh, that means operational data about our food distribution levels, public data about where people can find food, customer feedback data uh, that tells us where our partners may be experiencing issues or shortages, and billing and invoice data to manage the fiscal impact of this work for the city. These are all interrelated and they're all important and we could do a deep dive on any one of them, but today's demonstration, we're gonna focus on operational data. So in, you know, in, in the case of food, uh, as we've discussed before, uh, we have eight different distribution channels and the challenge of this uh, is that all of these track data differently. Uh, all of these have different means of tracking data. It comes in different formats. 
uh, and at the outset, there was no really unified approach to using this data. Moreover, all of these programs uh, during the response were changing very quickly. They were adapting to conditions on the ground. Uh, and so uh, there was no unified approach to data that allowed us to get a handle on the whole thing. We attacked that by putting together a small data team and focusing on a core set of deliverables and then working closely every day with the operational staff who was running these programs um, to really make sure that we were reflecting ground truth. Our process for unifying data looks something like this, which uh, even in this form looks a little bit messy, but uh, this is what good data governance generally looks like. Uh, I'll, I'll note a few things uh, about this diagram, which shows how data flows from the programs on the left to data sources in the middle, and finally to data deliverables on the right. Uh, and this diagram not only includes different types of technologies to store that data, whether it be email or a Google spreadsheet or an Excel spreadsheet or a database, it also includes people. Uh, these programs are complex. And uh, so part of good data governance is making sure that there's a person in charge of making sure that the data is accurate uh, and, and clean and timely. Uh, so before going any further, I want to thank all of these people for uh, the amazing work that they've done. And then note that on the far end of the screen, uh, those represent the, the dashboards that I showed you at the beginning. Our program dashboard, which shows us how much food is being delivered, uh, and then the fine food map. Uh, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, uh, one of these deliverables contains spatial data, the other does not, but they both are fed by the same underlying sources of data. And this is why, as we think about the holistic data strategy, geospatial data, non-geospatial data are two pieces of the same pie. So why, have all, why is all of this important? To understand that, we're gonna do a bit of a deeper dive into our food data, and in particular to the food distribution dashboard that we maintain to help us answer these questions. Uh, and fundamentally, this data is important because it allows us to know that we're meeting the needs of our community and feeding those who need it most. So to see this in action, we're going to look at a case study of one group in particular, and that is seniors. This is our overall data dashboard that you've seen before. We're going to take a dive into some of the dashboards that underlie it. Because we have all of this data organized in one place, we can do a deep dive into, for instance, senior meals. This graph shows meals distributed to senior nutrition program sites during the COVID-19 response. The brown line represents the baseline of meals that was delivered to these sites prior to the response, and the blue bars show how much food has been delivered during the response. It's easy for us to break this down by sites that are located within the city, sites that are located in other cities in the county, since we are the county operational lead. And by looking at this graph, it's pretty easy to see that food assistance requested and required among the senior communities during the COVID-19 response is above and beyond uh, what it was before. And so knowing this, uh, this made us confident that this was a population that needed to be served. And uh, so when the opportunity came to launch the Great Plates Delivered Program, we did so with confidence knowing that uh, this was an at-risk population that was uh, in need of food assistance. And so we launched the Great Plates Program. This is the Great Plates Program dashboard. Uh, and as you can see here in the top right corner, the number of participants each week and the number of meals delivered each week in the Great Plates Program has increased basically every week since we instituted the program. Um, so, you know, I think the, the key to understand here is not only can we use this data, but because we have this data at hand, we can start to predict food needs, respond to them, address constraints, and use our funding to feed our community, help local restaurants. Uh, these are the restaurants that are part of the Great Lakes Delivered Program. Uh, and to do this all in a way such that we're tracking data to make sure that we're feeding our at-risk communities and, uh, and doing so in a way that, that meets the need where it is. Lastly, before we move on to Beautify SJ, I want to note one more reason why this investment in data is so important. Uh, and that is that the thing about investing in data is that once you've done it, the investment pays off in ways that you didn't expect. 
since we launched the food data unit, we've not only used that data to help our food efforts, but to help efforts around the city. In fact, the food data unit has been approached by several other city departments who have used the data we've put together to achieve outcomes like tracking the climate impact of our food efforts through our Climate Smart program. We've used the indicators of food insecurity in our analysis of economic insecurity that has informed our approach to eviction moratoriums. And we're using food data to understand that's being run by the Environmental Services Department. So in short, getting out of the dusty basement means that it's available for a call to use C ahead of the time. At this point, I'm pleased to pass it over to my colleagues, Olympia Williams and Amory Brandt, to look under the hood of how data has informed Beautify SJ. Thank you, Andrew, and good afternoon, Chair, Honorable Mayor, and members of the committee. My name is Olympia Williams, and I'm the Beautify SJ Program Manager, and during the pandemic response, I'm the Operations Coordinator of our Beautify SJ EOC Response Branch. Next slide, please. As just a reminder, we have three goals that are part of our Beautify SJ EOC response branch. The first was to develop a systemic waste disposal um, system for our encampment residents, which I know we went into detail on Tuesday. Our second goal is really to ensure the continuity of our existing Beautify SJ initiatives and programs during this shelter in place process that we're currently in. And then our third goal is really to redefine, unify, and deliver Beautify SJ programs and develop a plan to better um, address the critical service gaps. We'll be doing that in more detail at our December 4th um, Beautify SJ study session. Next slide, please. So when we initially started this program, we knew we had to really scope kind of what the challenges were. As you see all of the dots, that is all of our illegal dumping and as well as all of the encampment reports that we, that we typically receive on any given month in the city of San Jose. We knew that we had two problems. They were complex and widespread, widespread, yet they were very distinct. And we had limited resources to, to address the service gaps that we had. So we really had to prioritize our service response to get the kind of the biggest bang for our buck. Next slide, please. So with limited resources, we wanted to look for two things. Where is trash and blight located in the city? And where are people living outdoors? Knowing that oftentimes the things that what I like to call our biggest pain points were where trash was and blight and then kind of where people were living in encampments. Those are typically the type of service needs and requests that our residents have across the city. Next slide. So where do these issues intersect? And this is where data played a key role in helping us to better respond to those issues, but not respond in a complaint-driven response but really put our dollars and resources where we knew the problem actually was. I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Amory Brandt. Thank you, Olympia. Next slide, please. I'm Amory Brandt, a Senior Executive Analyst with the City Manager's Office, and I'm currently working on data analysis and visualization for the Beautify SJ EOC branch. And I'll be going over some of the data-specific challenges that we encountered on our branch but we still were able to make significant progress despite a lot of these challenges. So as Olympia explained, when trying to develop a new program to pick up trash at encampments, we needed to know where the people were living outdoors and where abandoned trash existed. But no one data set told us all of that information. So we had to access data from multiple departments and databases. Some of that is siloed or static, uh, we also worked with multiple data sets that spanned the ge geographic boundaries of the city. So it's difficult to pull out what's relevant. Um, so we still achieved many successes on this branch using data. We still have a lot of work to do, but a large reason that we made progress was because of investments that had been made prior to COVID-19 in data staff or positions or in technology, which enabled us to take a data for informed approach that involved our data experts from the start and we were able to scope this very large problem down into a, a smaller one. Next slide, please. So we were able to be data informed from the beginning and involve our data experts from the start for two main reasons. Um, one is because we, um, through Olympia's team, we actually funded a Beautify SJ data analyst position in July of 2019. So I filled that position about a year ago, which meant that I had begun the work of inventorying all those data sets, looking in the basement and all of those closets 
for where this data was well before COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. So when this team was formed or this branch was formed, um, we already knew where all these data sets were. We knew how they were being collected and where they were stored. Um, we also were able to reach out right at the beginning of this branch being formed to our data experts in the GIS Center for Excellence because we had already formed some of those relationships. And so as soon as Olympia's team was redeployed to pick up trash at encampments, we reached out to the GIS Center for Excellence and within three days, they delivered a data tracking system for the Vitify SJ team. And this was due to a technology enabler, um, ArcGIS Survey 123. It was free for us to use. Um, so we didn't have to go out in any type of procurement because the licensing is paid already through Public Works. It was fast to create, easily customizable, and had a lot of spatial information that we could gather through this platform. Next slide, please. So in order to figure out where abandoned trash and people living outdoors were located, you know, these were two problems that spanned the whole city, but we wanted to know where those two problems existed together so that we could dedicate resources where they were needed most. And there wasn't a single data set that captured this. So we had to go through multiple data sets. We ended up using 10. They were in seven different databases or locations from five different departments. So to perform a geographic analysis or look at hotspots or overlap between all of these data sets, we needed them all to be in one location or basically in one map to do the analysis, which isn't necessarily a straightforward process when all of these data sets are in different places. Next slide. So all of these data sets were somewhere along this continuum of on the far left being you know, a local copy just on someone's computer that maybe other people don't have access to or know about. And on the far right, in a very centralized location. For spatial data, that's often the GIS Center for Excellence. And so we were working with data all along this continuum. And the, the data sets for us that we were using in the red or the orange areas required a lot of manual time and effort to be able to perform the analysis. Next slide. An example of that was um, some of our housing homeless concerns hotline data. So this is when a complaint comes in about where an encampment is located or maybe a homeless individual. And so this data set um, exists in a database, but it doesn't um, talk to other databases or it's not integrated with others. So to do this analysis, we actually exported the data from the database and performed our analysis on that copy. And when you go through that process, you're then not able to repeat the process again easily. Uh, and you're also not using the most up-to-date or recent data. Another challenge with this data set was that it didn't allow for spatial analysis because of the way the data was collected in the program. So we have locations describing something like, you know, between these two areas or, or near this intersection, but it wasn't easily uh, spatially identifiable. So we had to manually go through about 700 rows of data to finally produce the map on the right. And this is a data infrastructure problem that exists for one program, but it ends up affecting more than just that program when we have a problem that spans multiple departments and has a large scope. And this is now something that's on our Beautify SJ work plan. So we plan to integrate this data set and work with the spatial challenges we're having to make this data set more usable for our Beautify SJ program for during COVID and beyond. Next slide. So ultimately, and I know um, we showed this map during Tuesday's council meeting, we were able to create our hotspot map. So this was the result of you know, starting from a large amount of data that spanned the whole city, breaking it down into much smaller, more manageable areas. And as we explained also during Tuesday's council meeting, we sent staff out to ground truth these hotspots and get real on the ground data to back up what was happening um, or what showed up through our data sets. And then we designed a tiered service model for trash pickup, which matches the resources we have with the program to the needs of each area. So the outcome of this data informed approach was efficient, equitable, and effective. And that really ensures that we're um, ensuring quality resource allocation and service delivery. So currently we're, we're developing a lot of these data sets we continue to track where garbage is collected at encampments. 
how much, who is it collecting, where and when. And so we can continually make improvements to this program. And next we'll do a quick demonstration to show these tracking methods. So this map shows where um, all of our trash, trash collection is occurring um, in real time. So you know the map updates very quickly once the data is collected out in the field. And all of the icons on the map are showing Olympia's Beautify SJ team in addition to the contractors we have out in the field collecting trash. And then we'll go to the trash collection survey. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so when someone's out in the field, um, they can pull up this survey on their cell phone or an iPad or any smart device, and they can enter all the information we want. So this is our survey one, two, three platform that the Department of Public Works made accessible to us. We can customize the questions any way we need to help inform or change the data we're collecting. It automatically tracks locations. We can attach photos. Um, and then all of this data is populated through that map we showed um, in, in real time, pretty much. So we get this data very quickly um, and it really can inform our service delivery at a very, very quick rate. And I'll pass it back to Olympia. Thank you. So one thing we'd like to do is highlight some of our successes. Because we were able to use, the good part about us using data is it allows us to be accountable and remain reliable to the public and encampment residents. We can tell encampment residents when we'll be at the encampment to pick up trash, but we can also communicate back with our neighborhoods and businesses and when we will be addressing trash that people are so often complaining about. The technology platform can continue to be used past COVID-19. That's something I've already discussed with Amory about how we can modify it to continue to use this past the COVID epidemic. Some of the challenges though, our sources of data are still separate and it poses ongoing difficulties when we need to integrate data into one database so that we can use it quickly and effectively. And we need long-term investment in data and technology solutions. For those of you that have known for a long time, we had the San Jose Clean app for graffiti and that gave us the ability to take graffiti down extremely quick. It's a smart app, it gives us in real time data, we can adjust the maps immediately to do that, to address graffiti. We need that same system in place to help us with trash located throughout the city, whether it's trash on a street, it's illegal dumping, or it's trash located, located at an encampment. I'd also like to take the time to thank our Beautify SJ team that's on the ground every day, along with our vendors and contractors entering the data that we need and taking photographs so we can be responsive to our businesses neighborhoods, council, external partners as well. And the GIS Center for Excellence, Harsh, Tracy, and Matt, we could not have done this as quickly and effectively without you guys implementing and creating these tools for us to use quickly and giving us tools that were very easy to use. That makes a big difference. A special shout out to Jay, and Jay, I'm not gonna attempt your last name because I know I'll butcher it, but he's a GIS specialist in DOT. I'm gonna pass it back to Andrew. Thanks, Olympia. To end this presentation, we'll just leave the committee with what we consider to be you know, the, the core idea of all this work, which is that data can help us focus and serve our most at-risk communities uh, by ensuring that we have a holistic view of the entire city uh, and we're seeing data from, from every quarter and every population. With that, I'll hand it back to Rob. Mr. Lloyd, you're muted. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, um, Andrew and Olympia and Amory and Matt and your team. Uh, so next we actually have Jill North, now Jill North Mariani, who will take us into an update on autonomous vehicles along with Laura Wells. Uh, the Department of Transportation is leading the city's efforts in the area of autonomous vehicles and overall transportation innovation. So well, Jill. Hang on, we, what are we doing these, uh, Rob, are we doing both of these items then together? We were, unless you want to take a pause for a question. Well, you have to check with the chair to make sure that that's oh, how he would like to oh, do it. Sorry, my fault. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, did you want us to roll through both items and then take them as one, uh, or would you want us to take them one at a time? Uh, it's 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 up to you. Well, what's, what makes the most sense, Kip? I'll take your advice on that. We can go to questions if there are, I know there are two speakers, but if it makes sense to just go straight through. 
uh, we're, we're fine either way. I, I uh, normally we would stop on this item and and, and uh, pause for uh, public comment. Well, why, why don't we do that then? We'll we'll stop for public comment. Um, we'll we'll see. We have two speakers here, uh, Mr. Beekman. Thank you. Thank you for offering public comment. Uh, I think I'm going to need uh, my two minutes to speak about the AV things. Um, this this uh, item was was nice to hear uh, subjects. Um, you mentioned early on that data uh, gathering within city government of San Jose can be kind of a nebulous cobwebby experience and um, a, your your public uh, government website and how to search for information uh, is a good example of that. I, I you know I it's my own private joke that uh, you know the, the how how the reference to find data is like developed by someone who is like alive in 1922 is my joke to myself. I mean it has that sort of a thinking to it from from that age basically and how references and cross references are, are, are connected to each other. And I always ask, you know, in the early 2000s, you know, uh, there was a really bright, alive system of how, you know, you could look on a search engine and find information. And it was really interesting and, and bright and nice. And that has really gone by the wayside. And I'm really sorry that that has happened. Um, I hope you can try to make efforts to return to those times and those efforts. Um, to conclude, I always have an anecdote about, uh, how much time do I have, by the way? Do I have a minute? Can I have 60 seconds? Uh, with 60 seconds, uh, I, I always have the anecdote that, you know, the work of the AOPR data collection of the VTA has been really interesting at this time. And I'm really interested how pre-COVID-19 ideas can bridge into post-COVID-19. And so how, you know, they were working pre-COVID-19 on how ALPR collection can be from 180 days down to 90 days, down to 45 days, uh, commercial data collection. Now, how can San Jose practice those same sort of skills? And, you know, that it's the idea of good practices with, with, with the public and the public has right to know uh, ideas and, um, you know, it's just those good practices that are, are democratic good practices that bring out our more efficient overall better practices. And that's and that is fun and enjoyable to learn better democratic practices. How do you do that as thank, a- Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Bill, finish your thought, your time's up. And I'll, we'll see you on the next item, I'm sure. Um, the, the phone number ending in uh, 9288. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, sorry, I'm using my phone for the first time since. Anyways, um, I just have some questions. Well, first of all, I want to thank you guys for all your hard work on setting up all these databases. I think it's really encouraging to see you guys keeping track of uh, the most needed areas. Um, I do want to know, though, if there is the same um, diligence put forward with an app and, and data collection for maintaining green spaces and yard, well, not yard trimming, but you know, like some, some to who comes out and not just picks up trash, but takes care of the the weeds and the overgrown uh, landscape. So I want to know if there's an app for that. Who maintains it? Uh, and then if there's like a maintenance schedule, if it if people come out routinely and clean up these areas, or if I just have to keep calling and calling and calling until the city sends somebody out. And I also would like to know if there's any sort of uh, community involvement that will help get the neighborhood active in maintaining it. Because I know I would not mind getting together with my neighborhood to clean our area because our area has been getting a little uh, trashed. <laughs> so I don't mind going out and cleaning it if it was like a group effort. So I'm wondering if there's any sort of community involvement or platform that gets people together uh, to maintain spaces. And yeah. Can anybody answer those questions for me now? Because I, I appreciate the trash. 
cleanup, but I'm also wondering who's maintaining the the overgrown. Yeah, so so this is actually a time <laughs> to hear from the public. Um, it's not uh, question time, but uh, I'm sure that the I and other members of the committee will will take note of the question, and perhaps one of us, us will ask it for you uh, in a bit in our own okay. questioning. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And um, there was another speaker, but I, I think they lowered their hand. So, um, are there any comments uh, from the committee? Yes, there seem to be so. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councilman. I think a couple of folks were in front of me. We'll let you cut in line. I'm okay with that. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, just in response to the last question of the member of the public who spoke, uh, I know this is probably on us, meaning my office, but is the Beautify SJ site still accessible for folks who want to volunteer? Does anybody have any idea? I know we had a website up for people who want to get engaged. If not, yes, we'll yeah, my understanding oh. is that we are updating that. Okay, great. So in the next few weeks, maybe we'll have something up and running. I know we're doing a refresh and uh, everybody's being pulled off of COVID duty back into uh, doing a lot of stuff. So I just, uh, all right, so that will be ahead. Um, so I just say to the member of the public, uh, hold on. Uh, we're going to get our beautifysj.org website up and running and hopefully I'll provide easy access for people who want to get engaged in beautifying our city uh, as we launch several uh, and expand several programs. Uh, thanks to everybody for your hard work and there's an enormous amount of work that's gone into this and we had a great presentation Tuesday as well. Uh, I just want to understand better on the, um, the challenges with the data hygiene and our ability to uh, be able to geolocate particular data points when people are reporting, for example. Um, are we actually fixing it at the front end or is this a ongoing labor intensive exercise? And Maria, it looked like you had something you wanted to add on that. Yeah, so we're, we are working on fixing that on the front end. Um, so we are in contact with uh, the GIS Center for Excellence in, in Public Works and we're putting together a work plan so it's a combination of on the data side, integrating the database, but also making some changes in how that data is collected on the front end, how those complaints are in uh, the intake process. So we'll be doing both during this time. Thanks, Emery. Um, <clears throat> and the, um, the question, uh, or the issue about the, the what works cities, um, sort of the pain points where we still have some work to do, um, Clearly data governance is one of them. Another one area was repurposing. Can somebody tell me what repurposing means? That's essentially, when do we use data to make a decision to wind down a program or to shift resources over to other things that we might not otherwise have done? Um, we actually feel like we've done pretty well on that, but we were failed to articulate that to, to Bloomberg despite repeated attempts. So um, I think that would be, fair to say the one area where we sort of have a difference of agreement uh, with, with Bloomberg on. But to be fair, we do think this the, the times that we're in are all about repurposing and making sure that the right resources are going to the right things and saying no to some things that we've said yes to in the past um, uh, in order to accommodate what's most important. So I, I think that a lot of the work that, that we'll be doing as a, as a city and as a council to make sure that we are shifting the resources to where they need to be will qualify for that if it's data driven. Okay, so is it too simplistic to say it's really around using data to drive our budgetary decisions? Not really. No, that's, okay. that's it, especially when it involves shifting. Yeah, okay. And I know we've got a lot of those hard decisions ahead. And then I think there was one other area I can't remember on that slide that seemed to be data governance repurposing one other area where maybe there's a bit of a pain point. Yeah, it looks like Andrew's gonna throw that slide back up for us or tell us what that that is. Cause it was, yeah, there were three areas where we were behind the curve. And Rob, you look like you're stuck in traffic right now. That's the uh, courtyard of uh, the city hall, I'll, I'll change. Oh, that's what it is. I couldn't tell very easily. I'm sorry, I was worried you were gonna get run over out there. Yeah, so re results-based contracting was one of the other ones. Oh, got it, okay. Um, <laughs> I know that that's a, a long discussion, I'm sure. 
Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, good to know. Uh, thanks. All right. Um, I'll invite uh, my friend from the second district, Mr. Jimenez. Thank you so much. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, I very much appreciate the presentation. Thank you everyone for all the work. Uh, you know, as we're talking about this, what comes to mind for me is a recent action the council took on Prop 16, on supporting Prop 16. It was a unanimous vote. And what that is going to do is repeal Prop 209, uh, which prohibits a, a, a lot of different things as it relates to demographics and affirmative action and things of that nature. Uh, staff did put out a memo uh, recommending the, the support of Prop 16. And then one of the, in the memo they wrote, they put something down that really stood out to me. And I think it's applicable to the discussion we're having here. And in the memo, I think Lee Wilcox wrote, it says, without better data and the ability to communicate, communicate data, the city will have challenges understanding the equity impact of policies and programs. And so what I'm curious about is, I know obviously we have to wait to see if the voters pass Prop 16, but uh, are we, is it too early to begin thinking about how that additional data that we're gonna be able to collect uh, may play into some of these decisions? It's not too early at all, in my opinion, sir. Uh, I think that, you know, we we can make inferences. In some cases, we do have sources of data on on race, um, but it, it, you know, to the extent that the the law changes and allows us to more broadly dig into that and use that as an understanding of the challenges that are facing our community, a part of the whole scope of the data work that uh, Andrew talked about in terms of the, the governance and the communities of practice will enable us essentially to, to move more rapidly to use that data. We are already uh, aggressively applying equity lenses to the work that we're doing. And our hope is that those types of changes will allow us to have a more refined, nuanced, and more accurate understanding of, of the impact on, on the different communities. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Kip. And, and so is it uh, my understanding based on the memo that staff put out again about two meetings ago is, is that we're we're prohibited from using that and making decisions, but it seems like we may already be collecting some of that. So is it just a matter of turning essentially turning the on button and say, okay, we have the data, we can't use it. Let's push the button. Let's now use it and sort of uh, have it uh, bit, get plugged into the decisions we're making or, or how would it in some cases, we don't have the data at all. We're, we're not allowed to collect it or it's not collected in a way that that's, we're able to integrate it in. So it will be a combination of both being able to use the data we have in broader ways and the ability to co collect um, a broader set of data within, again, within the framework of our privacy work and, the, uh, and our security work, because we want to make sure at the, at the heart of it that uh, when, especially when we're going deeper into understanding the nuances and subtleties in the community, we're doing that in a way that never invades people's privacy. But, yeah. but it's both being able to collect more data and being able to use the data we have more broadly. Okay, and, and, and then- Council Member, Council yes. Member Jimenez, uh, Please. if I could also add some stuff. So it's always been possible to collect data on race, gender, and other information. It's a question of how you use it. That is, that has been the problem in the past um, because uh, under Prop, um, 209, you were not able to use race, gender in decision making by government agencies. So while you can't collect it, the problem has been how you use it. Um, mm -hmm. And clearly, if Prop 209 is, um, is removed, then you'll be able to use that. Uh, but it can't be the sole basis for it. But you can use that as a basis for making determinations. But again, there is still prohibitions against using solely the, uh, race or gender as the as the only reason for making decisions, but it will be allow you to use it on a general with other criteria as well. Whereas right now you can't use it um, in making a government decision. And, and just so I understand it, so thank you for that. Uh, so in summarizing your point is we can collect it, but we can't use it. You can collect it, you can look at it, but it's a question of how you use it. How you use it, okay. Um, because in many cases you can use it for purposes of non-discrimination so you can say, because what Prop 209 said is you can't uh, have affirmative action, but you also cannot discriminate on the basis of race or gender. Right. But to the extent you have data where you say, we're not providing any services to people in this area mm -hmm. under this sort of gender or this kind of uh, racial profile, then we have to fix it. Okay, mm -hmm. so it works, it works so that you can try to eliminate discrimination but it cannot be used affirmatively at this point. All right. And so, and so thank you for that. And, and with that, Kip, I guess what I'm curious about is, 
is it, it is it worth turning on that collection in anticipation of the passage of Prop 16, knowing that we may be able to use it a little differently and more proactively, assuming it passes? Yeah, I, I think that given given the importance of race and equity in the work that we're doing right now, I think that w essentially what I would ask is that uh, we've already got that as part of the data strategy work plan, is that we just kind of double down and take into account uh, an intentional analysis of those legal changes and be prepared for that. I, I believe that's pretty much already in the work plan, but I think it's it's worth underlining and emphasizing because that will be a significant shift and it does relate very much to uh, the moment in time that we're in. Okay, all right. And I guess you sort of answered my other question. My last question is just if it were, were would require an update to the citywide stra data strategy. Uh, to the extent that it does, we can do that administratively and we'll make sure that that happens. Okay, cool. And I suspect you're going to be doing that proactively and looking at it because you know this is a theme that keeps reoccurring, right? And I think rightly so. But uh, yeah, thanks for bringing it up, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Um, thank you, Councilmember Jimenez. Uh, on to my friend from the 6th District, Councilmember Dev Davis. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I want to take a minute. I am a data nerd and this is the only place I get to be a cheerleader. So I want to congratulate everyone on our, our silver status on the, the what I think it's what works cities. Is that right? And um, the stakeholder outreach, we are, it looks like we're number one, right? That's what that, that's what that means. Andrew's nodding. So I'm going to take that as that's, a yes. That's correct. All right. Awesome. Um, that is something I think all of my um, all of my residents would be happy to hear, and because we know that San Jose is it's it's very important to to do outreach in San Jose, and San Jose is a very engaged city, and um, I lo I love that we're doing that well. So one little bit of cheer for that. Um, I did want to ask about the the uh, Beautify SJ. And I want to thank you for going through the whole process in a little bit more in depth than we than we got on Tuesday. I was struck by the number of data sets, the cross departmental data sets that that um, went into kind of the final final map that we saw at Council on Tuesday. When did you start this bringing this together? Because I know data, I know dirty data. And I know data that's coming from a lot of different places. And this looks like a, a large number of people didn't get any sleep for a long time. Let me, let me do the larger, let me, I, I want to do a one, two, three hit on this. I want to do the, the old guy historical context. Then I want to turn it over to Matt for some of the GIS context. And then I'd love to hear from Amory and Olympia on the more immediate. I actually unearthed, um, since you asked sort of, when did you get started on this? I actually unearthed the document as I've been shuffling around and, and cleaning out my garage um, around how we, uh, a, a thought piece on how we might use geographic data to inform um, uh, our service delivery work in San Jose and what we would need to do to get there on it. And it was, I had dated it 2001. So uh, I've been working on this particular one since for the last 19 years. Fortunately, other people have taken up the baton and been much more effective and efficient than I have. So Matt, I'd love to take your kind of piece on this and then hear from Emory and Olympia around kind of, because uh, I think they've made more progress in the last four years than, than I certainly did in 15. And then in the last four months, probably than we did in the last four. So Matt, and then uh, Amory and Olympia. Thanks, Skip. Thanks, Council Member. The, the, the one thing that's really interesting is we began, I think you remember a few uh, sessions ago, we had a data catalog that we presented with where we started in 2015 to where we got to uh, more recently. And I think we stopped at like 600 data sets that were in our spatial data repository. Now we're up over 700 and some um, as of last count. And so we build those things uh, much in a way so that people can take advantage of them. And that's exactly what Amory and Olympia did. They took advantage of that and found some other missing pieces on it um, that we need to keep honing in on. And we keep working systematically through the different data sets to make them all speak nicely together so that they can take advantage of them both in the data collection, but then also in um, kind of making, trying to get those aha moments where they can can really use these tools to visualize, but then also drive their business decisions. Amory and Olympia have been fantastic business users of this data sets. And really they, they know enough about the tools to drive it themselves, but they, they um, tap a few folks to gather some more data and, and make a few more nice tools for them. 
that just did an amazing job of kind of honing those pieces. Um, it, it really was a great, what was, I'll go back to the very beginning. I think this began, what, six, seven weeks ago? I don't know, you guys remember the exact date. They reached out to me about the food stuff. Sorry, the plane going overhead here. Um, and after the food's like, hey, you know, we might be a little bit early. Can we, I don't know what we wanted to, we haven't started yet. We don't really have our business plan yet on, on the Beautify San Jose piece. I'm like, no, 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 this is the right time to talk. This is the perfect time to talk. Cause then we start gathering all the information around it and get it. So we build it with data in mind and, and their end in mind from the very beginning. And it's, they did the absolute right um, thought process of thinking about data from the very beginning of their work. And it was fantastic. Amory and Olympia. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, I think the only thing I would add is just that um, Olympia and, and a lot of other people also had the foresight to hire a specific data person to work on Beautify SJ because there's so many different data sets, as you saw, that span multiple departments. And that wasn't all of them, just you know, for this branch's work, there's many, many more. Um, so I had time starting in you know July August of 2019 to do this research and figure out where what where the relevant data was who was collecting it and even you know just go on a listening tour and figure out what people were doing in all these different departments and so the work really was able to start you know last year um, and then when this branch was formed we were able to hit the ground running and that really just accelerated the speed you know we had all the people aligned to get the work done and we had already done all of the research. Olympia? I would just, the only thing I would like to add is that this is a small portion of what we do under Beautify SJ. We have many other blight reduction and beautification programs and I'm hoping at some point that we can do that same thing so we have one place where all of our data is because we all, this will help with trash specifically at encampments. Amory's going to help repurpose it to use it for the anti-litter program, but we still have a multitude of other programs that we need to have integrated to give us, so we can better utilize and really just leverage resources to deliver the services that we want. I, I have to close just with that by giving a particular shout out to you, Olympia, and your leadership on this. You know, I, as, as somebody who's coached technology leaders for many years, you often find people who are, who, who might understand the field. And then sometimes, you, and you often find people who understand management and operations, and you often find people who understand data and technology. You almost never under, find somebody who understands the field, understands operations, and understands data. And, and, and Olympia, you are one of those people. And you have, uh, because of your leadership, driven from your empathy and understanding of the, of the field, you have really made the data use very, very valuable in the way that it's been delivered. And, and to me, you exemplify the kind of next generation technology leadership that we need to build and retain in the city. And so I just wanted to, in front of mayor and council and community, really appreciate you publicly for, for your leadership and your effort on that. It's, it's impressive. Thank you, Kip. Thank you. No, yes. Thank Olympia, you. remember all this when it comes time for your uh, evaluation, all right? You can just pull out this video. Well, you video. Should. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah, I want to uh, just underscore everything Kip said. Olympia, your your statement just made it super clear that you're, you have a data-informed culture with your team and that you, you have a vision for for where it should go forward. And I just I, I just wanna commend you guys for, for what you've um, done and what you've been able to pull together. As we've seen our, our trash problem grow and grow over the last five months, the fact that you have this data and you were able in six or seven weeks, I think Matt said, able to pull that together in such a way to get us toward, okay, now we're getting to, we're getting to a plan to for lack of a better term, dig ourselves out from under it. Um, I just think, I know the residents think it's just go pick up the trash already. Jim had that in his slide. And and having having a systematic way to do that will in at the end of the day, save taxpayer dollars and give us a better result faster, even though it seems like it's, right now, you know, being in it, it's, it's really hard. I mean, I look at the, the map of the illegal dumping complaints and it's, it's literally almost the entire city has had an illegal dumping complaint. I'm assuming, I don't know what time frame this, this map was, but it's probably just in the last year, I'm guessing. And it's practically every street. I mean, there's almost no place that you can't, that there wasn't an illegal dumping complaint. So it really does underscore for me how 
citywide the the problem is and it's not just in the places where you know we've seen housing encampments for example um it's really and that there's just one other thought that comes to mind and this is not related to data specifically but that map the rapid illegal dumping complaints map could be used for an education piece when we to go out to the community and say look it's it's all of us and we all need to take part in you know not not littering right <laughs> not not being a um not contributing to the problem and helping to be part of the solution and i really think that that piece is something that that we have to talk about at count i'll just say it for for my colleagues that's something that seeing these maps has made it very clear that this is a problem that every single san josean needs to be a part of the solution and even if it's just not throwing your cup out of your of your car window or not dropping it on the street when you're done even if it's you know just picking up a little bit while you're walking your dog that's something that we could all do to make our city look better and and then the city staff and the work that you're doing we would build on that by taking care of the systematic trash pickup and the big things that we see because those little things become big things eventually um so that's just the other thought that i had that's not at all related to to the data process but i just wanted to to put that out there for my colleagues thank you all right Great, thank you. Um, for me, I guess I just want to ask real quick um, about the Bloomberg uh, uh, what, what works uh, designation. So I, I heard that you know over two hundred cities applied, and, and we were one of twenty four. And, and and what I, I gleaned from that is it's a, a rigorous process, and we made the cut, which is, which is great. Um, but I also understand that we probably had to invest city resources into uh you know getting into shape uh to, to qualify for that cut and and i kind of want to help the public understand a bit more about why that's worthwhile so is this just kind of us padding our resume in a sense to, to take the extra ap course or get the extra internship to, to be impressive or what what is the the value inherently in being a part of this seemingly exclusive uh, network well to be honest, we are a bunch of grade grubbers, so there, there, there is the recognition piece that we do appreciate. However, fundamentally, the reason that we chose to do this is it actually was aligned with delivering better performance. And so we knew that this was a way to rally our focus around how do we prepare these capabilities so we can deliver better performance. Then there are two additional pieces that we're very self-interested in that this certification unlocks. The first is access to an absolutely brilliant network of people who are in the same complicated work we are of running cities, using data and making things better for residents. And by being a, a part of the that network, we're invited in literally to conversations and to share lessons and to learn lessons from others who've been there before us. And we're big believers as we know, and we've said before in R&D, uh, rip off and duplicate so that we can find things that other cities have done and bring them back. And this is exactly the network of 23 other cities that we can now do R&D from. The other thing is, uh, last time we checked, the Bloomberg Foundation has a little bit of money, um, and they have been exceedingly generous with us in the past, and this kind of unlocks a, a new game level, if you will, in terms of qualifying for potential grants, both in terms of technical assistance and then actually, in some cases, implementation. So there is the opportunity to unlock um, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of dollars of additional resources to do real work in the city simply because we have the certification that is completely uh, dependent on having this certification. Cool. Uh, Andrew, I saw that you unmuted. Did you want to jump in or? I, I would just uh, add, Kip is uh, completely correct. And on, on the technical assistance front, uh, Bloomberg What Work Cities has a network of nonprofits and technical assistance providers that they make available to certified cities. And uh, immediately before COVID, uh, we had kicked off an engagement with one of those technical assistance providers on data governance and creating better, better data governance for the city that was uh, that was free to us and, and we were really excited about and we're excited to restart uh, when when we get the chance. Uh, so just to, to give some specifics to that, there, there are uh, real tangible benefits to the city that come from being 
a part of this cohort. Excellent. Uh, I, I saw yes, Remember, could I, could I just respond very briefly also? Um, I just want to put a fine point on something that Kip said. Uh, it, it's certainly helpful to get grants from Bloomberg, but it's also really helpful to get grants from lots of other organizations because Bloomberg has been really leading the way for a lot of foundations and understanding um, how to use data and technology in cities. So, um, you know, this is a really important step for us. And we knew that our team was great all along, uh, but it's important for otherwise, other folks to brand us uh, as we know we are. And uh, I, I apologize I didn't come out and say congratulations and thank you to everyone right at the outset. It's been a while since we've gotten the certification and we haven't had a chance really to, to mingle. So uh, a very big thank you to everyone who's been working so hard to get us to this stage and, and most importantly beyond. Great. I mean, my takeaway from that is that we, we are investing uh, to, to make the cut, but I think there's a high return on investment from, from what I'm hearing everyone say. So it's, it's well worth the, the time and the effort. Um, I, I see that Vice Mayor Jones um, had some questions. Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, uh, thank you for this presentation. It really um, uh, speaks to the, the core of what we're trying to accomplish here in, in the city in terms of using data and, and offering and providing uh, a better quality of service for our residents. And I want to pile on Olympia and just also commend you and, and your team for the, the great job that you're doing. And the actually the almost impossible uh, task that you've been assigned to uh, address this problem, which we know is, is so significant and so um, enormous, but you're doing a fantastic job and so is your team. Uh, my, my colleague, uh, Council Member Davis is a big data nerd. I'm, I'm just a little data nerd. So I actually had similar questions around uh, the integration of the local copies versus the siloed database uh, versus uh, a centralized database, as well as data quality. So uh, Council Member Davis actually asked that question and you guys answered it really well. So what I really uh, would like to ask is, can you provide me with, and you don't have to go into to the, the weeds, but kind of a, a, a scenario of using the various data sets and all the data that you presented to get to the outcome that you uh, presented as well. Uh, of efficient and equitable resource allocation. So can you kind of just at a, at a high level, just kind of walk me through all that, all that data to get to the outcome? Would, would you like a specific example? Is it like a, a case study? Yeah. Specific examples are always the best. Good. Well, I'm, I'm going to prime uh, somebody else to, to, to come in and perhaps Dolan from the food side might have one. Um, um, but anybody else can join in. I think that uh, I'll say two things very qu quickly. One is I always go back to my training from Sri Shivananda, who is the, is the CTO at PayPal, and he speaks about data in this way. Data by itself is meaningless. From data, you can see patterns. From patterns, you can derive insights. And from insights, you can drive action. So it is, it is that chain of, of data to patterns to insight to action that we seek to energize in service of the community. I'll pull one example from, from the work of, of um, Olympia Amory and a team that Jim uh, Ortbal articulated. Without understanding the data, we would not have seen the patterns that there are basically three different ways our types or our uh, types of dumping scenarios or homeless scenarios. And we would not have then been able to have the, the act, lead toward the action of creating three different service delivery models on a tiered approach. And so that tiered approach of three different types of service delivery models was based on the insight of three different topologies, which came from thousands and thousands of pieces of data that were put into patterns. Without that, we would have done basically what any common sense uh, person would have done. We would have gone and picked up the trash. Um, and that would not have resulted in that, that, that very big distinction between trash that can be picked up with a, with a grabber and a, and a, and a stick and a, a couple of bags versus the ones that need to have equipment versus the ones in the middle, uh, which allows us to have this differentiated approach. So I think that's a good example of data informing our, our service delivery. And now I've given uh, Dolan enough time to prepare one mentally, so I'm gonna hand it over to him. Uh, thank you, Kip. Um, Dolan Beckel, Director of the Office of Civic Innovation, but currently the EOC co-lead for our Food and Necessities Branch. I think another example of that mashup is around the, um, the data necessary to maximize our reimbursement, right? One of our 
one of our um, fundamentals of uh, the finance department as we're working through the coronavirus is to maximize our reimbursement. And so there's a number of different data sets that's necessary for us to integrate uh, through that process flow diagram that Andrew showed in the beginning from all the kind of the data stewards and the different channels of our food distribution channels and the people who are stewarding that data to collecting the data to rationalizing it. And so, you know, we have to integrate data from our vendors who are providing food services uh, like um, Second Harvest Food Bank, um, like um, uh, Great Plates Delivered. We have to integrate that with all the different cities and geographies. We have to identify what is reimbursable, what is not reimbursable, and then we have to QA the data. And then we actually have to respond almost real time to the 14 different municipalities we're currently working with when they say, we'll pay for this, but not for that. Or how about we slice it by reimbursable versus not reimbursable. So in order to maximize the reimbursement, in order to minimize the impact on the general fund, um, that's one example of there's probably, you know, 14 cities times 10 vendors, time, you know, there's hundreds of data sets that we're, we're working with to be able to get down to that core, you know, driver of maximizing reimbursement and minimizing impact to the general fund. And, and, and I'm so sure Andrew can, can, yeah. can provide even more detail if he wanted to get even weedier into the basement. So I just would add, just for, since we're in a public meeting, just to, to translate impact to general fund means oh, sorry. Uh, if we're able to maximize our reimbursement, that means that the federal and state government pays the cost. If we're not, that means we have to cut other services that we're already providing in order to make sure that people are fed. So bottom line, we're feeding people who need to be fed, but by maximizing reimbursement, the, that allows us to continue providing other city services that would otherwise have to be cut in order to make sure that people are fed. So I'll, I think we'll, we'll stop there unless you'd like us to take another whack at the pinata. No, I think that was a, that was good. That was exactly what I was looking for. I, I, I think it's very helpful for both this committee as well as uh, the, the public to understand, you know, they see the presentation, they see all this data, they see the outcomes, but it's good for us to connect the dots in terms of how we uh, arrive at those outcomes based on the data. One more dot then, Dolan, how much money are we talking about in terms of reimbursement that we're seeking between Coronavirus Relief Fund and FEMA for the food to give a sense of of, of, of how much a hit or a miss we have on this? Well, yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of answer that question two ways as, as we presented to the public and city council last week, we have about 38 million in, in grants and uh, contracts to deliver food and necessities distribution to the county all at vulnerable and at risk uh, residents in the county. If you look at the reimbursable amount that we want to, uh, we want the other 14 cities to support us uh, in, in sharing the burden of that food distribution, that's about 21 million. Sorry to interrupt, Vice Mayor, I just want to make sure we understood that. <laughs> Thank you, that definitely quantifies things. That's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, team. Great. I, I did have one uh, question about the data uh, stuff. So, so you know, what a long time ago we were talking about data pools and and getting everything and, and how to make it useful. Uh, so, hearing that, I'm I'm impressed by what we've been able to do within our constrained. Um, get, um, when we have all, when we control all the variables within our own city and, and achieving the things that we set out to achieve, um, I'm, I'm reluctant to. I, I know we're probably not at a place where we can uh, use the data to do things on demand. Where I, you know, one of the council members puts up a challenge and says, "Let's try to do this," and then you have to scramble to kind of meet that because we're probably not at that place where we can uh, use it as versatilely as we want. Um, one of the the things that I found personally uh, in, in organizing my own data sets for, for other reasons um, is that we have to, having more data than we need is just as harmful as, as trying to organize what we do have. So uh, in, in the spirit of, of Marie Kondo, like, you know, what are we doing to, to spark joy and, and keep what we only need? I know we're a government agency. <laughs> um, we, we have rules where we have to keep things, but are we keeping things beyond the need that we need to keep them? And paying to, to store them in the cloud or whatever. I'll let Rob take a take a take that one. 
I, I think we'll update our open data community architecture with a section on the Marie Kondo of uh, data, <laughs> data uh, governance. But um, council member, um, as part of our open data community architecture, part of that is contemplated. One is how do you connect data where it lives and is freshest? Um, what actually is of common interest? Um, and how do we layer that between what we um, use and then what we publish and making sure the security and privacy are there? Your, your theme is very important that we need the right data in the right places at the right time. And um, both the Bloomberg work and Andrew's comments point to the investments we're gonna need to make in governance um, very, very soon. Um, I, there's one thing I'll, I'll say and I'll turn it over to Andrew. Um, the technology is at a point now um, where we're going to have much more data than ever before. It's gonna be fresher around um, con what we call continuous data, audio, video, telemetric. Um, that's going to connect with our ability to control services more precisely than we ever have before. And that's going to take a different skill level, a different group of people, and different investments to use well. And on that note, your comments actually are presaging um, a different generation of data management that we're going to have to figure out and be ready for. Um, but our environment is built with half a petabyte of space for the most important information that's the freshest that people are going to use to meet community challenges. And so, Andrew, if, if you would um, add anything on top of that. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Council member, I, I would say that one of the challenges as, as compared to a, a Marie Kondo approach is that uh, in order to do things like, like, like data on demand and answer questions, uh, sometimes we don't know the questions that we'll need to ask. And so uh, what we want to have and, and what Rob is uh, you know, alluding to in terms of the technology that we're building is a system that can hold and protect and secure all of the data while making sure that we have a, a, a governance structure on top of it that surfaces the data that is most used or, or most important. Um, because to the extent uh, that's, that's legal and to the extent that we can protect it, you wanna keep it all. Uh, you wanna keep as much as possible because it could be useful. Uh, but then you have to obviously have to organize on top of it to make sure that you don't get lost in the fog. Okay. Um... Interesting. No, that makes sense to me. I, I also just think that uh, if we can f draw some sort of line where there, there's certain data that we should collect, but after 20 years or however many years, we can automatically go like throw away. I, I was helping my mother move recently and, and there are boxes that she insisted on keeping, but when we opened them up, they were just magazines from the 90s she'd never read. Um, so it's just, just you know, we, we were keeping, it was taking up space, but it wasn't really anything important, right? Uh, so, so that's where I was going with that. But anyways, I appreciate your effort and it's very impressive. And uh, we certainly have a, a cut rate, um, first rate uh, team doing this. So, oh, Jordan, sorry. Did you want to say something? Council member, yes. Uh, just to further add on to what Andrew said and to answer your question, you know, one of the things we need to consider, obviously, and we are doing so already and CMO has been doing great work is the data retention schedule. I think that would be more the, the formal term to, uh, to answer your question. So that is, you know, de-identifying, anonymizing, and aggregating data sets, and then figuring out also at what point, you know, do we need to, uh, that this data set retention period has expired, uh, and, and doing the Mary Kondo uh, of cleaning out your closet. So um, we are considering that, and so thank you very much for bringing that, and Andrew's doing great. <laughs> yeah, right. and this, this is Dolan to hit it home with the example on food distribution, right? Um, you know, one of our privacy principles is we collect only what we need, but we need to retain the data for reimbursements for a significantly longer period of time because there's a federal ability to claw back the data uh, as they decide to audit Money. it at their own discretion, right? So, so we, we are actually, you know, ha some of the complexity, some of that data the city will retain for the duration we need to. And we've actually built that into our contracts with our food distribution providers. In some situations like the schools, the schools from a privacy perspective don't wanna release all the detailed data. So we have to work with them. So they retain the data in case the federal government comes to us and we have to go to the school. So I think the good thing is, as Jordan pointed out, and as Andrew pointed out, you know, we're applying our privacy principles actually uh, in both our practice and our contracts and making sure privacy and data security especially around food data, which is ultimately at an individual level, is, you know, is retained at its utmost privacy and security um, uh, for the interests of our public. All right, well, thank you, Dolan. Um, good stuff. Can I get a, a motion to accept the report? So moved. Uh, All right, uh, do we have to do a roll call, Tony, now? Yes. All right. Yes. We, we, 
Please proceed. Adams? Yes. Davis? Yes. Licardo? Yes. Jones? Yes. Yeah. Aye. Thank you. All right, with that, the motion passes. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll proceed to this, the second item or the next one. I'll just do a briefer introduction. Um, but uh, Jill North Mariani is going to go through our autonomous vehicles update um, and take it away, Jill. All right. Thanks, Rob. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee and members of the public. My name is Jill North Mariani, and I'm the Innovation and New Technology Program Manager for the Department of Transportation. Uh, I am also currently serving as the program lead for the Great Plates Delivered Program within the Food and Necessities Branch of the Emergency Operations Center. And today, um, I'll be sharing a status update on autonomous vehicles, which will include regulatory um, industry and local effort updates. This report will provide an overview of the regulatory environment within California, which dictates what autonomous vehicles can operate and how they can be operated. It will also take a look at the latest industry report data, which demonstrates the pace of autonomous testing on California roadway during 2019. We will then move on to demonstrating our leadership in the autonomous vehicle space through our pilot efforts with Mercedes-Benz, Bosch, Daimler, and AutoX. And finally, we will wrap it up with the status of the industry in a COVID world and our commitment to furthering the advancement of autonomous vehicle technology um, during this time and beyond. So just before, present, before, we, before we get all the way, if you could click on the, the slide thing and just have it fill the whole screen for us, that'd be super oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that little guy. Sorry. <laughs> Did it do it? And then over to the side, uh, right, where, right where it says 26%, you have a little icon that does the slide thing. Oh, yeah. Right, right next to that one, to the left. Yeah. Yeah, that should do it. See, it was bothering me because I knew something was off. Thank Boom. you. <laughs> you got it. Sorry. <laughs> it bothering me. I was looking at it and going, oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so throughout this presentation, um, it's important to keep in mind that COVID-19 really has an, it had an impact in um, the autonomous vehicle world, and it's kind of created two worlds. There's the, the pre-COVID world and the post-COVID world, and I think we're really familiar with that. It applies to everything, and autonomous vehicles kind of, you know, are not an exception to that. So the tone will, you'll notice kind of a tone change um, through, as we end the presentation today. Um, As a reminder, autonomous vehicles are vehicles that have the ability to automatically perform some or all of the tasks that have traditionally been um, performed by a human driver. Because autonomous vehicles will have a tremendous impact on the safety, mobility, sustainability, and livability of our community, staff have been undertaking efforts to better understand and influence the development, testing, and deployment of these vehicles. Staff have adopted a, stat, a set of guiding principles to ensure that autonomous vehicle testing efforts within the city of San Jose have positive impacts on our community and address critical transportation challenges that we face. One more quick refresh on the definitions of autonomy. The Society of Automotive Engineers has identified six levels of driving automation with levels zero, one, and two, featuring no to few driving um, advanced driving assistance um, features such as cruise control and lane assist levels three, four, and five are considered autonomous and ranging complexity and scope of self-driving vehicle function and human interaction and engagement. Levels three and four are what are currently being tested on our roadway with level five automation serving as this holy grail um, in which a vehicle does not need to rely on geofence or fixed route locations and can make all driving decisions without any human engagement whatsoever. Sorry. Okay. Um, so testing within the state of California has matured. And as of July 2020, there are two regulatory entities that have oversight over autonomous vehicle testing within California. 
The first is California DMV, which regulates the operation of the vehicles within the public right of way. And the second is the California Public Utilities Commission, which regulates the abilities for our, the autonomous vehicle to carry passengers. DMV issues four types of AV permits. These permits include AV testing with the driver, AV driverless testing, and AV driver and driverless deployment. There are 66 companies that have an AV testing with driver permit and three companies that have AV driverless testing permits. Currently, there are no companies that have been granted deployment permits, which means that AV companies cannot charge for rides in the state of California. Deployment permits will not be issued until CPUC has finished its pilot program, which currently has seven participants listed on the right. One additional note regarding regulations before moving on to industry activity is that in December of 2019, DMV adopted a new rule, which allows testing of light duty autonomous delivery vehicles on public roadway. The new rule applies to vehicles that weigh less than 10,000 pounds, such as passenger vehicles or mid-sized pickup trucks, which previously were prohibited from testing for delivery purposes. Of the 66 companies that have an AV testing with driver permit, only 33 of those operated in autonomous mode on public roadway as of the end of 2019, driving a total of almost 3 million miles um, with 570 autonomous vehicles. I have also included data from 2017 and 2018 for a year over year comparison. Additional insights from the 2019 industry activity data indicate that 23 of these 33 active companies have fewer than 10 vehicles and drove less than 10,000 miles in the past year. Also notable is that no companies have utilized their driverless uh, autonomous testing permits, meaning that there has not been a single driverless autonomous mile driven on the public right of way. There are 10 companies that operated more than 10 vehicles and drove more than 10,000 miles. These are the companies that are highly active in demonstrating scalability. These companies account for more than 85% of the autonomous vehicle activity occurring, occurring on the public right of way. Staff has established active contacts and relationships with all of these companies listed here and has executed agreements with two of them in an effort to demonstrate autonomous vehicle technology within the city of San Jose. As a result of the request for information released June 2017, the city of San Jose entered into a demonstration agreement with Mercedes-Benz, Bosch, and Daimler to conduct autonomous vehicle testing within the city. This project is intended to follow a three-phased approach with increased complexity and scope within each phase. Phase one testing commenced in November 2019 and ended in March 2020. The scope of this testing focused on real world integration of the autonomous vehicle into the transportation ecosystem. The participant pool was extremely limited for the first phase, primarily to company employees as our industry partners continued to quickly integrate software solutions as challenges occurred and in parallel beta test their ride hailing app that was developed to support testing in San Jose. Throughout phase one, we were really in learning mode together. Being the first city to engage with industry on this level of testing presented lots of interesting opportunities for us to pave the way and learn together as partners. One of the first ways we demonstrated this was by attending community meetings together along the route and co-presenting. Together, we heard the concerns and fielded questions from our residents about autonomous vehicles while demonstrating how the technology works and what we were working to gain from our partnership. As a part of our ongoing commitment to safety, we engaged our San Jose Police Department early and often. We hosted several in-person brainstorming sessions with our officers to uncover opportunities where law enforcement will need to engage with a vehicle ranging from teaching the vehicle how to respond to road flares to how to handle a crime committed within the vehicle. Our officers were also interested in understanding how they could approach the vehicle safely and ensure that the vehicle was not in active driving mode um, and who they could contact in the event that the vehicle itself broke the law. Additionally, 
we engaged with San Jose Fire Department, demonstrating the safe locations to use the jaws of life in the event of an emergency or should the vehicle need to be pulled over to allow a fire truck to pass. These opportunities to share insights on different scenarios encountered by our police and fire personnel in the field proved as valuable inputs that need to be integrated into future iterations of vehicle behavior. We also attended several meetings with the San Jose chapter of the Federation of the Blind and ultimately entered into a memorandum of understanding with this group to host ongoing feedback and testing sessions to ensure that autonomous vehicle technology is being designed with those that could benefit the most in mind. We received lots of incredible insights about the mobility challenges this group faces and intend to continue these conversations. Another key insight from this pilot included the side-by-side -side deployment of Mercedes Alpha Fleet. These dozen or so non-autonomous vehicles operated alongside the fixed route in order to demonstrate capabilities of the ride hailing application developed for this project. Alpha Fleet operated similarly to other ride hail systems, which allowed flexibility in pick up and drop off points for their employed participants. It also allowed Mercedes-Benz to test how autonomous vehicles would perform in a mixed fleet environment and the role that they could provide in the transportation ecosystem. Surprisingly, given the small sample within the pilot and limited transportation options, feedback studies from participants indicated mode shift with one participant reporting that they had chosen to sell their car as an outcome of this pilot demonstrating all the transportation options available to them. As a result of our data sharing agreement, we were able to obtain data that we hope to integrate into our Vision Zero program. Vision Zero is a commitment to eliminate pedestrian fatality and major injury occurrences along our roadway. The data provided to our Department of Transportation is derived from the sensors located on the autonomous vehicle. The sensor data is then pushed through a machine learning algorithm to identify and classify pedestrians. We then layered those data points on a map to identify where large numbers of pedestrians are crossing that are not protected by intersection infrastructure or protected crosswalks. This is what we call pedestrian crossings in the mid block and are very difficult occurrences to track with standard practices and oftentimes have very deadly consequences. This data is especially interesting as we hope to use it to point us where to conduct further studies and to make infrastructure improvements to help us achieve our Vision Zero goals, making our community, community safer for our residents. In March of this year, Mercedes-Benz Bosch and Daimler notified DOT staff that they were going to suspend autonomous vehicle testing efforts in accordance with the local health ordinance and pending COVID-19 developments. We are hopeful to re-engage for phases two and three when appropriate and safe to do so. The second AV pilot project we have, code, we have co been co-developing is with AutoX. This pilot seeks to replicate the dash route when the surface is discontinued, connecting Deardon Station to San Jose State University. This pilot is intended to utilize a ride hail application provided to San Jose State University staff and selected students. Original plans called for commencement of this pilot in May 2020, but unfortunately are on hold until further notice given the public health ordinance and COVID-19 disruption. In July 2020, AutoX did become the third company in California to be awarded a driverless testing permit from California DMV. Driverless testing would not be utilized in the proposed pilot, and AutoX does not intend to utilize the driverless testing permit at this time. As we look toward the future, the autonomous vehicle industry is facing much uncertainty in the short term. COVID-19 has created economic instability within industry, with many companies choosing to pause testing efforts and in several cases have laid off all of their vehicle operators. Staff expects to continue seeing consolidation between companies, as is the case with Amazon's recent acquisition of Zooks and Intel's acquisition of NEO. We anticipate that the post-COVID-19 autonomous vehicle world may look very different, with fewer technology leaders and different business use cases. DOT staff remains committed to aligning AV efforts with broader transportation goals, as well as making the city a desirable place for AV companies to develop and test their technology. 
staff commits to continuing existing relationships with autonomous vehicle partners and ongoing leadership in statewide regulatory efforts throughout the COVID-19 response. However, additional commitment is contingent on staff availability given EOC food and necessity deployment. And with that, I'll hand it back to Kip for closing comments. Thank you, Jill. Thank you for your good work, both with autonomous vehicles and uh, making sure people are fed. Um, with that, I, uh, Rob, I'll hand it back to you if there's any closing comments and we'll hand it uh, to the chair after that. Rob? Um, none for me other than we do know we have an item to return back um, once we have updates on autonomous vehicles, but that's gonna be pending um, the COVID-19 uh, and other disaster work. Um, but thank you, Kip. Okay, back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. We will go to the public, and I see there is one Mr. Blair Beekman who would like to speak. Hi. Uh, thank you for this item. Um, the VTA, you know, back in uh, April of 2018, I think it was, they very nicely had a long presentation series about AV vehicle use uh, from a professor at Stanford who is very much stating that there was going to be a possible economic disruption process in the early 2020s. And that would be the time that AV vehicles would make, could possibly make a very strong return uh, or, or a, its next level of, of life. And that I guess is not happening, but you know, I thank you, I thank the VTA for doing that. And, and it helps us be all prepared for what, where we're at now um, we could have prepared better, but we haven't. But where we are now, um, I'm just worried that it's a bit of poor taste to start the AV program at this time. I feel like a proper sense of mourning would be to start this program, say, at the beginning of next year. And that's just my personal feeling. I know that there was a lot of conflict within city government when to start up this program. Uh, I hope you take this program slowly. And, and treat it as more of an abstract process still. It looks like you're in some final stages, but just if you can keep in mind the idea of abstractness as opposed to actual action, you know, I, that's helpful to me. Um, you were talking about uh, uh, the geofencing ideas, and that's basically surveillance technology. That's going to be pulling in a lot of surveillance and data on people who are crossing the street and you were trying to describe that, I can't emphasize enough the importance of talking about open public policies for those sort of geofencing ideas. And that's how you create your happy harmony and community. It's not by hiding it and keeping it secret. Uh, and finally, a thank you to uh, council persons Carrasco and Perales, who are gonna be now a part of this project that really needs to be considered in terms of thought, how to consider it uh, being on the east side of San Jose. So that is a good step that you're taking in that direction and, and good luck in your efforts and keep it really mellow, <laughs> please. Thank you. All right, and back back to council now. Um, Mr. Mayor. You're still on mute. Thank you very much for the sign, Kip. I got to get one of those. Those are great. Um, Councilor Dib, could I come back after the next uh, questioner? Sure. Uh, sure, of course. Just have to uh, deal with something urgently. Uh, thank you. Mr. Jones, go ahead, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I actually just want to just uh, commend Jill and, and the team for um, the outstanding work and effort that uh, they've uh, accomplished up to this point. I know that uh, COVID-19 is really... Uh, derailed a lot of our efforts. And I was really looking forward to this presentation uh, before all this, everything kind of went sideways because uh, I had an opportunity to actually ride in one of the, the cars going from Deer Don to Santana Row. And it was uh, an eye-opening experience in terms of what the future holds for autonomous vehicles. And I'm just looking forward to when we get to the other side of this, uh, this crisis, uh, moving forward with, uh, this, this program because I think it's going to be able to accomplish a lot of great things. So I just want to, again, recognize the team and all the hard work and what they've accomplished so far. All right, uh, Mayor, are you ready? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Sorry for that interruption. Um, 
I, Jill, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. Hey, I, I know you were you took this on early, and then I know you had you were promoted and you had other responsibilities, and it got handed off. And I'm just curious, who owns this now? Is it is it you or is it somebody else? So I, I temporarily filled the IT manager role in DOT until they completed their um, recruitment, and there's now somebody that fills that role. So then I came back into the innovation new technology program manager role, and I hold, I oversee this program. Except okay, that so I'm in the food and necessities branch now. So right, so you're in the food business, not in the car business. I get it. Um, okay, so understanding all that, and we still have. I know there was some Knight Foundation money. Is there other grant funding here that's currently allocated for the program? And do we have any idea how much left? <laughs> um, I don't have that information uh, um, about the Knight Foundation funds. And I don't think we have any other funding available. I know that I've been coordinating with um, Jordan, um, Sun, and uh, Ramses to start attending some of those meetings again to try to rope that back together. Okay, great. I, reason why I raise it, um, and I quietly communicate this to other members of the team, you know, I understand there are really very limited opportunities to do a lot right now, uh, given what's going on with COVID. And so everyone's looking for a different path forward. And what may be very promising and perhaps something that really <clears throat> checks a lot of boxes in terms of what we're seeking to really get out of autonomy in our city around safety and equity and mobility and improved environment and so forth. It, it seems like a partnership um, with VTA may be um, more compelling from those, the standpoint of reaching those objectives. And let me just to articulate um, what's going on. I don't expect you to respond or, or have any commitment, but be interested in your thoughts. We, um, as you probably know, VTA is undertaking a review of its light rail line uh, to understand, is this really something we wanna keep investing in? Because we're gonna have to make a very big investment in about six or seven years for um, tens of millions of dollars of replacement of light rail cars. Um, and I can't recall the exact number. I think it may be in excess of 100 million. So there's a major investment for the agency. And I think Nuria Fernandez has wisely decided to take a look at other uh, technologies as several of us have, have, have also urged. Um, and certainly from our own research and our own RFI on Stevens Creek and airport, uh, what seems to be, there seems to be some convergence around the notion of moving to a rubber tire autonomous electric solution uh, for transit, whatever that might be, pod cars, buses, whatever. And, and I think the ETA study is still, under, is still going on, but they're going to be reporting out on it, I think, in just a few weeks. And then again, actually, they'll report on a bit tonight, and then again in a few weeks. And I think we'll have a final report in December. And it seems like a partnership between the city and the VTA to really understand how autonomous electric buses running on our streets, particularly and the 42 miles of right away that's already exclusively controlled uh, by the public and the, where the VTA light rail cars are. And understanding that really well, um, since we're likely gonna be at the, at the center of all this, since most of light rail runs through San Jose, th that a partnership like that might be really um, intriguing um, for really moving things forward in a way that's gonna be very, very impactful. I know that the industry is gonna keep doing whatever the industry does and we may or may not be terribly relevant in terms of them moving forward, but it seems like on something like this, we could be really relevant because we would be the first major city in the country, theoretically, with an autonomous uh, transit system. Uh, and obviously, there's a lot of considerations around safety and so forth, um, where we'd need to be deeply involved. And so I just wonder if it is time for us to, to at least consider a pivot and say, maybe for now, if, if a if, if COVID is, is forcing us to put this on hold, we really want to think and pivot more toward uh, mass transit solutions. Uh, I, I Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think um, your point is, is excellent. Um, I, I completely agree with you that the, there should be a closer partnership with VTA around autonomous and transporting people. I do want to, you know, kind of from my research and what I've kind of seen kind of emerging in this post-COVID world, I think that there's also a um, second use case that's really emerging 
around the delivery business. And that was kind of why I thought it's really interesting um, how, how focused, and maybe it's because I've also been on the food and necessities branch for Great Plates Delivered, so very hand in hand on delivery, <laughs> um, is just this new opportunity in a lot of different ways, um, potentially, and it's and really seeing a shortage of driver and the driver pool and how that's really kind of keeping, you know, some of these service services are causing delays because there's just not enough drivers that are shared throughout the peninsula to be able to provide these delivery services. So I, I think that you're absolutely right. I think that, um, you know, with, with BTA and I would love to do it, um, but also kind of keeping an eye on how things are changing and to be nimble enough to be able to address that and to do cool things like that as well would be, I, I would think more of a two-pronged approach. Thank you. All right, um, I think that's it for questions unless uh, Catherine Hernandez or Davis, if not, uh, I, I, I just have a one quick question in terms of autonomous vehicle um, in, in that world, they, they often talk uh, on, I think it's a one to five scale. Um, and I heard, I remember a few years ago, or not even a few years, but I remember some some companies coming to, to, to talk to me about this and, and very excited about different partnerships. Um, I forget their names exactly, but it seems that I haven't heard from them in a while. <laughs> So, um, uh, and you know, uh, can, can anyone speak to that? We, we, there was a lot of energy behind this about maybe two years ago and, and, and you know, COVID and, and whatnot, but um, where are we in, in that process? Where is the autonomous vehicle universe? Are we at a, a three yet? Yes, yes, we are. We, we are comfortably at three. Um, are the Mercedes-Benz, Bosch and Daimler was really trying to start to integrate the level four. That was um, really trying to make sure that the vehicle could operate from point A to point B without any driver interaction whatsoever. Um, level three is kind of where the vehicle sees a stop sign and knows that it knows how it needs to stop or it's able to interact in an intersection environment. So there's different degrees of complexity and scope, but the driver still has quite a bit of engagement on the vehicle. Um, you know, level five is always really interesting um, is because it's still very conceptual. Um, you know, when I envision it, I think about, I tell my vehicle where I wanna go and it identifies the route that makes the most sense. I don't tell it what route to take. Um, so it really does become kind of more of a brain. I think that, you know, the, there's folks that are still very much focused on that. And, you know, they're, they're leveraging this downtime with COVID where they're not necessarily doing the testing on the roadway, but they're starting to do some of those, um, you know, the, their backlog of software requests that they needed to do. Um, and I think that when we get past this, they'll be back in full force. Okay. Um, the, I, I'm, I'm appreciative that the city of San Jose seems to be all in on this, uh, not so much for the, uh, you know, futuristic, uh, everyone has their own car vision, but more for applications that are public serving, uh, trying to get the disabled from, from A to B, uh, trying to, to improve mass public transit, uh, to help the working poor get to, to jobs and such. So, so that's uh, wonderful and, and I'm glad we're behind it. Uh, just as a general matter though, um, the, the, the utopian vision of autonomous vehicles is that eventually we don't need to own a car because most of our cars are sit, sitting in a parking lot uh, eight hours in a day while we're at work. So the idea being that you, know, you, you hop in a car, you, you get off at work and then the car goes around to helping other people out doing other things and then picking you up when you need it, uh, having a car on demand, I guess. Um, and, and that's kind of like a futuristic, one possible future. But now that everyone's afraid to um, you know, share things because of COVID and whatnot, is this, do you think this is a temporary hiccup on the way to Oz or is this kind of, uh, now we have to go on a new path now, that vision is obsolete. Well, I mean, the, the way that I think about it honestly is, I think, I think people, I think as soon as we get this behind us, we'll be back to the way that we like to live. I wish I was sitting in council cham chambers with all of you right now, you know, um, I don't like being isolated. Um, I think that we we're seeing that is that, you know, we need more ways to connect. And I think that as a society, we'll get back to that as soon as we're able to safely. And I think that we'll see more of the sharing environment, maybe even because we miss being around other people and meeting people. 
Maybe that's just my rosy thought. It's just delusional. Nobody ever says they'd rather be in council chambers. <laughs> uh, that's a first. I, I, I was recalling, actually, uh, Mr. Mayor, a conversation we had four years ago with Mark Andreessen. Um, and he said at the time that the future of vehicles is, is three things. ACE, right? Uh, automated, connected, and electric. And I think what we've realized is that, the, is that the market will take us there. We will have automated, connected, electric vehicles. The question is, will we have ACEs shared, the S on the end? And so what we see in San Jose is our, our piece of this is making sure that there's an S on the end of that and that those, those, uh, those resources, which are going to happen with or without us, are, are shared, are available equitably, are available for seniors, are, 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 are complementing of transit. So uh, I, I think, uh, Mr. Mayor, your point on the, the potentials for partnership with VTA as it's at this transformative moment is a powerful one. And we'll, we'll re-engage and take, take you up on that because we are committed to that shared concept and realizing, realizing that the other things are cool, but they'll happen with or without us. Okay, very cool. Um, I guess with that, if I can get a motion to accept the report. So moved. Second. All right, uh, go ahead, Tony. Jimenez? Yes. Davis? Yes. Ricardo? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. And I believe that is it for items. Is that right, Kip? Rob? All right. Sounds good. Did, did we miss the vice mayor or did I miss it? Did the vice mayor have a question? No, no the vote. The oh. vote. Aye. <laughs> Okay, the vice mayor is on the record as has been having voted aye. Uh, we now, we'll, now, we'll now turn to public uh, public uh, forum or open forum. Go ahead, Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Um, to, um, to to mention uh, the first item today about uh, trash. You know, good luck in your trash issues. I hope. Uh, but I tried to say yesterday, I hope you can have uh, cool heads in dealing with uh, the homeless issues around the trash issues. And uh, the trash itself can be the major focus at this time. And, and it seems like that is important and uh, good luck in those efforts and how you work with Caltrans at this time. Um, I also wanted to mention, uh, I think just to mention, uh, I think Anthony Mata uh, the police officer who, who often attends, you know, most community functions. Uh, he, I think he can be a really good example of how to look for a police chief for the future of San Jose. I'll need to be saying that more often uh, in public open forum. And um, what else did I want to offer? Uh, I have a few bits and pieces of stuff to offer in this uh, final uh, open forum, and I can't qu quite bring it to mind. But, uh, oh yeah, I guess another another point I wanted to make is that, you know, I, I, I hope you can take, uh, thank you for explaining kind of a timeline of what to expect of the AV project. Um, that was interesting to me. I hope you can take my own personal comments to work mellow uh, to heart and, uh, you know, in the same way, yeah, just that I, I you know, I, I, I hope you can understand the context that I mean, I may not have the depth of knowledge to understand how you guys work. But you know, I hope we can talk about it in in mellow terms how we move forward in the next ten years with the project. Thanks for your time. All right, thank you. And with that, uh, this meeting of the Smart Cities Committee is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Oh wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait sorry. Uh, <laughs> somebody else raised their hand in the interim. Um, the phone number ending in nine two eight eight. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Hi, um, I just wanted to follow up. I, I was speaking in the beginning and I was been tuning in, but I didn't hear any of my answers to any of my questions. And since I have all of you guys in the same spot, I'm just wondering where do I go to for that information? Because I love that you're collecting data, but if I, as a resident in San Jose, don't know how I can access it, or if I know that somebody is actually paying attention how how am i to be informed of what is happening because like i said i've i've 
reached out and emailed and called and all the things about uh, not just the trash, but like I said, the tree maintenance and the shrub maintenance that is just out of control by my house. I don't know where to go or what data is being collected to maintain this area or I, I just, I would love for somebody to tell me how I go about knowing when somebody is going to be coming out here to, to look at it or if it's just sitting in a database somewhere. Yeah, uh, so we apologize. <laughs> Um, I did intend to ask you a question. These, these times that we're talking about open forum and public comment are, are for the public to, to express their opinion, not to ex get involved in exchange back and forth. Uh, but I did, I did intend to ask that. So if someone's on the line can actually help um, the speaker understand if we have an app for, I think it was cleaning yards is what she was asking about earlier. Chair, can we, can we also clarify wh where she lives, what district she lives in? Do you know what district you're in? Yeah, I'm right on the line of District 3 and 4. I'm on Mayberry between, like, by Independence High School and the BART station. So I'm sure you heard my voice for people who have been in the last three meetings over the last three days because I still have yet to hear anybody get back to me or any answers. And because I'm located next to this BART station, I would think it would be in the city's best interest to maintain the area surrounding the BART station so I'm just wondering, who do I have to talk to to get some peace of mind or something that you guys are hearing? And I know it's not a back and forth thing right now, but I am at, I, I don't know where else to go because I'm not getting anywhere. Council I'm not member, getting anywhere. Council member, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you, you can't have a discussion of an item that's already been completed. You Got can it. make references. You can direct her to people to talk to afterwards. Um, but unfortunately, you, you can't have a, another discussion unless you open up the item again. That's fine. All right. Well, uh, in light of that, I, I if I don't know your name, but but if I, I believe that you did uh, send a note to my office <laughs> of the online form, I'm, I'm guessing. Recently. Yes, I did. Yes. So I, I had your contact and, <laughs> and um, I will have my team reach out to you shortly or you might have already heard back from them. OK, so right. I guess I'll just sit and wait. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. With that, Bye. the meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone.